I'm on to item three now, which is um, announced. I'm oh, sorry, well, there's one apology, which is Carrie Goodwin. I don't have any other apologies. So on to item three, which is announcements. I don't think I have any. Nobody else has any announcements. Public questions, Sally, I don't think we have any. No, we haven't asked, Commissioner. Thank you. Urgent items. I just wanted to say one thing before we go into the main part of the agenda, and that, that is around these events that have been taking place more recently. Um, I mean, it's clear to me that in the past couple of weeks we've seen a, what I would see as a collision between, on the one hand, the need for people to remain largely at home, and when they're out, not to gather in large numbers and to keep social distancing distance. And, and then on the other hand, we've had this impulse, which many have felt, to go out to protest, initially about the killing of George Floyd in the United States of America, but then that's become a wider protest uh, against racism in all its guises in our society in the United Kingdom. Um, and there's been a bit of a conflict there. I just wanted to say that from my perspective, I thought the South Yorkshire Police have managed this um, really difficult situation um, very well. Um, I think it's been done in a measured way, and I think the public on the whole have understood the difficulties that that has posed for policing and um, have been very supportive. We've, we've not had lots of responses from the public which should suggest anything else. But clearly, if these protests are to continue, um, this gets more difficult for the police. And I would hope, an appeal in a sense, I would hope that those people who are planning to continue with the protest, I think there's an obligation on them to think carefully about what they're going to do and to think imaginatively about what they're going to do so that as far as possible we can maintain that social distancing in order to safeguard the health both of protesters themselves but also those around them and the more vulnerable in our communities. But I accept that it is a the difficult place we're in, and I think the police are in, uh, yet again in, in, a, in a difficult position. But my impression is that the public so far have accepted and that's been managed very well by South Yorkshire Police. Um, and there'll be opportunities for the Chief Constable and others to come in on that, I'm sure, the issues as we go through the agenda. So item six, items to be considered in the absence of the public and press. Again, I don't think there are any of those. Declarations of interest, are there any? In that case, we come to the minutes of the Public Accountability Board, which were held on the 12th of May, pages 1 to 10 in the pack. Are there any matters that anybody wants to raise as to the accuracy of the minutes? Are we all quite happy with those? In that case, let's come to matters arising in actions. Um, this is item 9, 11 and 12. Commissioner, where are we at with that? Yes, Commissioner, there, there is only one um, outstanding action in relation to um, Debbie Carrington, the interim um, Chief Finance Officer for the Chief Constable, presenting at a future PAB the position regarding the uplift of police officers. That's the national programme. Um, Debbie, I think we're waiting for you to say when would be convenient to bring that information back to the future pad. Okay. Can I just clarify, is this around the financial position or is this the, the complete picture in terms of the recruitment, etc.? Well, I'd, I'd assume that it was the financial position, but you probably can't say, you, you can't simply present a set of financial figures without having some context around it. So. I imagine it's a bit of both, is it? So what, what I would do is obviously refer to the uplift through the monitoring report as and when uh, the situation, there is something to report. So from a purely financial point of view, I would expect to cover that through the monitoring uh, report. And obviously that will come to the, I think the August tab, the monitoring is due to come to. Um, but if it's a wider, uh, if it's the wider piece, that would, I suspect that would require a standalone report. I, I, th I think it'd be good to be brought up to date both on the finances um, and on the wider position as to how the uplift is going. So I, I don't think it needs to be long, but, um, but fairly succinct. But that would be helpful at the July pad if we can have that. Okay, I'll, I'll discuss with you. Sorry. I think, sorry, Debbie. I think it's Michelle again. I think that the, the, the public have also um, asked through the panel in 
relation to where officers are going to be going. So I think it's a, it's a sort of profile of um, the, the recruitment and the numbers, really. Okay. I'll discuss with Jackie outside of the meeting, and then we'll we'll come back and confirm timescales if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. So we come then to some substantial reports uh, under force performance, and uh, the first of those is the um, Doncaster District summary, and uh, I'll be asking you, Sean, in a moment to say something about that. Can I make a, a just general a couple of general points? Um, one is about the use of acronyms. Um, there are there are a fair few in the report today. There often are from uh, the reports we have from SYP, and I think well, we're all guilty of it. We all use acronyms, and we're all used to doing that, and we all know what they are. But just to bear in mind that these reports do find their way onto the website, and they're in the public domain, and the public don't always understand that. So if we can just um, uh, make sure that we're given some. Um, amplification of what the uh, acronym is at some point at the beginning of the report, that would be very helpful. As far as, oh, and the, the police and crime panel have also said that um, they would find it very useful if the district reports that we have month by month could, um, to some extent, follow the same format, so they're able to compare one with another, and I understand that, and I think we'll try and work out something of a, of a something of a template, not to be too restrictive, but to enable the police and crime panel to find their way through by um, comparison in, in that way. So we, we'll take that away and have a think about that. Sean, when it comes to the Doncaster report, I'll do what I've done in previous meetings. Rather than have you go through it all, we'll assume everybody's read it. I'll take you to some of the things that um, I want to ask questions about, and then after that, it'll give you an opportunity to say anything more about things which either you or your colleagues think are important and we haven't raised um, as we go through the report. So if you're happy with that, I'll take you first of all to page 17 in the report. And this is um, paragraph B3.1. Uh, so the bottom of 16 into 17 and then uh, into that page. Concerning yeah. the neighbourhood teams, and working with Doncaster Metropolitan Borough Council. I'd, I'd be interested to know how this is working out, how you do the aligning of your teams with Doncaster's, what, what it means, whether it means you're co-locating, how you, how you do that. Uh, and insofar as you're able to strengthen those teams, whether that's something that can continue or whether you've, um, in a sense, reached a plateau now. If you could just say something around it. The alignment with Doncaster. Yes, yeah, so, so what we've done over the last 12 months, Commissioner, is develop a very close working relationship with the DMBC. That's, that's not only at a strategic level, but down to a, an operational level. How that's manifested itself in, in reality is there's a general agreement now that as we develop our neighbourhood portfolio, we we will not only develop uh, additional policing teams, but uh, what we're going to try and do is is integrate uh, key operational individuals from the MBC into those teams. So at uh, a local operational level, we'll be able to create a, a multi-agency problem-solving team. Now. The, the best example of that at the moment, because COVID has really stopped uh, our, our development of those teams at this point in time, and we will continue to develop those in the near future. But the best, the best uh, uh, example is, is the team at Edlington, whereby since the creation of that team, uh, we've seen on, on a weekly basis uh, meetings between the various agencies that have a, a stakehold in that community. They uh, develop uh, multi-agency plans around vulnerable individuals, locations and issues. And we've seen a substantial reduction, not only in crime, but, but in, in terms of antisocial behaviour. We were using that as a pilot to see how effective that, that approach was and it clearly is effective so so it will be a template as we move forward the other development that we've seen uh, and it's just coming online now is is locality working so uh, across the the four areas within Doncaster there will be multi-agency meetings taking place each week uh, between stakeholders again looking at 
address those issues that are more complex. So, in my opinion, I think we've got a template that, that uh, will significantly uh, improve community safety within Doncaster, uh, but uh, it's a joint initiative between the police, the NBC, and other stakeholders. Yeah. 
intelligence-led approach, use targeted patrols, more robust defender management, uh, and, and start to develop a, a preventative approach with a partnership, target hardening those 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 areas that that uh, were most vulnerable, and that's why since November of of last year we started to see a consistent reduction. That's that's certainly accelerated in the last two or three months, uh, March and April, and May has seen the, the lowest recorded figures in terms of burglary we've seen for su some substantial time, but uh, I, I, I don't think that the district can, can take all the credit for that because it, it's clearly uh, a fit picture that will be seen across uh, the entire country with uh, reductions in serious positive crime because of the government restrictions. Yeah, and obviously something that has to be watched as we come out of lockdown and those restrictions are relaxed. Does something similar apply to robbery on page 21? This is 7.4. Um, you talk about we have less than uh, or fewer than one robbery a day. Yeah. Is, is this about, again, about knowing who these people are and you have to deal with it, with them? It's, yeah, it is. There's, what what we see in in Doncaster, Commissioner, is that most of those 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 robberies that we do experience are are fairly uh, I, I wouldn't say that 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 they're low level in the sense of their their uh, their low level force has been used to take uh, a bike or a mobile phone from from individuals. Uh, we we again use uh, an intelligence-led report. We try to effectively investigate each and every one of these offences, and uh, our, our detection rate for the robberies is, is is fairly high. So we try to make sure that we very quickly uh, home in on the offenders and stop those escalating. And in that way, we've managed to, to keep the level down to, to what is less than one per day. Yeah. Okay, thank you. At the bottom of that page, the crime, prison crime unit, we, we note the success of that um, approach and that initiative in the prisons. Uh, we have commented on that before, so I won't linger on that, John, but just to note it as a, as a really good um, piece yeah. of work, ongoing piece of work by your officers there. If I go to eight seven which is quite a way on in the um, agenda, so if we can find our way to 817. Um, yeah, page 17, Commission. Uh, page 817, this is, um, you're talking about um, Doncaster officers are now getting to the public quicker and in turn managing investigations better by arresting offenders more quickly and addressing yes. the issues. Of, I wonder if you'd just say a little word about that because that's um, very important and I just wonder what your feelings are about how that goes on beyond COVID. Yeah, I, th I think what, one of the things not only in Doncaster but across the course we try to achieve over the, the last 12 months is improve the timeliness of, of our attendance at in, incidents and therefore uh, improve uh, the, the service we, we provide to, to victims. Uh, in Doncaster, we, we've introduced uh, what we call uh, RMSs, or Resource Management Sergeants, on, on each of our teams has joined the conference. Those those individuals are responsible for oversight of demand, uh, reviewing each incident in terms of, of assessing vulnerability and prioritization. And it's through that, that more effective group around managing our resources using them more efficiently and effectively, we're able to attend 
vulnerable people is much improved and uh, the, the quality of, of the outcome that we get for those individuals is, is much improved. And to that extent, I think we're in a position where we will be able to expand that team further in, in August to include a, a third team. And I, I think given that domestic abuse in terms of our the number of prisoners that we have on a day-to-day -day basis is around about 65% of our prisoners. It's, it's right and proper that we we uh, adapt our workforce to, to manage those important issues. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, you're, you're right about uh, domestic abuse, and it, and it has been an area of considerable concern during this uh, lockdown period as well, and, and Mark is going to pick up on that um, shortly. The only other thing I wanted to comment on was your, on page 32 and on was your, um, your advisory group of young people and uh, we know the photograph of you and them, so they are real, there they are. Um, yeah, that's really quite something because it's often quite difficult to engage with young people, but uh, congratulations on that and hopefully when all this lockdown is uh, relaxed a bit, we might be able to meet them uh, and see them in person. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Short. I just wonder whether there was anything that you felt you wanted to comment on particularly that, that I've missed in here. No, I think, I think the only, only thing I would say, Commissioner, is that I think it's, it's an opportunity uh, just to, to reflect on, on where we've, we've uh, come over the last three months, particularly with, with COVID. And uh, the one thing I want to put on record is, is uh, how proud I am of, of the response of, of the officers here at Doncaster. Uh, it's, it's a difficult time for them. They, they, they have to, to go into difficult situations on, on a day-to-day -day basis. I know on an almost daily basis they, they've been subject to uh, assaults and, and people uh, spitting or coughing in their direction when they've been arrested. Uh, but but to their credit, and when you look at uh, our absenteeism rate, it's now at one of the lowest levels it, it has been for some substantial time. Uh, I looked at it last week, and it was only 2.3%. And given that we're in the, the midst of a, a global pandemic, I think that that just shows and demonstrates the motivation of our staff at this time. Well, that is quite remarkable, and um, yes, do pass on our thanks. Um, on behalf of the public, really, to your staff in Doncaster. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for this uh, full and comprehensive report. Does anybody want to ask any questions or make any comments uh, on Sean's report? If, if not, shall we move then? Thank you very much, Sean. Uh, shall we move? And if you want to disappear, then do disappear. Um, shall we move to item 11? Uh, Mark, you're going to give us a verbal update on... Um, domestic abuse, because this is an area that has caused considerable anxiety, as you appreciate, as we went into lockdown. And I think um, if you can pick up on a couple of these things, certainly members of the police and crime panel, certain members of the public who were emailing in were concerned about what was happening during this period. And uh, what seemed to be a mismatch between what national health lines were picking up, the number of referrals for them, uh, seemed to go through the roof, but that wasn't translated into um, local groups here receiving referrals, in, and we, we found that a bit of a puzzle. And then, of course, we were wondering what was happening during lockdown, uh, whether people were able to report to the police or whoever, or whether they were just simply um, unable to do that because, and they were inside a house with a partner who was abusive, and what, what that created for them and for any children in the house. So something around that part would be very helpful. Good morning, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, just there is um, a bit about the domestic abuse, but Dave generally does the broader update on the COVID piece. Do you want any updates from Dave, or should I just move straight to the domestic abuse? Uh, Dave would like to do that, and we'll come to you then for domestic abuse. Yes, yeah, that'd be ideal. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Good morning, Commissioner. Um, I, I'll just give some exceptions and really set the context of domestic abuse within that framework of, of how we've approached COVID, what it's meant to uh, crime demand and our resources. Uh, and I'll speak to um, DA in part, and then if you need any more detail on that, uh, we can expend on that. So, it, I mean, it seems a long time ago, but South Yorkshire uh, Police held its first gold meeting on the 5th of February when we recognised the uh, very early challenge coming from it. I think we've benefited from that early intervention and, and organisation and early investment, certainly around uh, early flow of PPE. So I took around resource and capacity, really taking the point that Sean just made. And we, we've fared very well. We, we've put enormous structures in place of supporting our staff in terms of health and wellbeing, which you'll see in the fairness report later, so I'll not dwell on those now. Um, but that's resulted in very low abstraction rates, low infection rates, and really throughout the challenge, and as we are now, we've got full capacity offering full service delivery with no real reduction or change. The, the only changes we have made is reflecting the change in demand, for example. You know, we, we don't have nighttime economy, so it's pointless having overlaps of officers working into the early hours when that demand for a short period of time wasn't there. So we, we changed service delivery to match demand rather than through abstraction of resources. Um, in terms of command and coordination for COVID, from February, we've had um, a dedicated Silver Command in our op support unit. That's got a dedicated Silver Commander, supported by a Silver Suite that operates seven days a week, and that includes ops planners, duty planners, HR, legal, a 20-strong um, COVID tasking team, and 16 specialist trained uh, disaster victim recovery officers who acted as our part of the pandemic multi-agency response team. So they've been responding to the community debt that we've experienced, which um, at the peak was around three times more than we would expect. So both over the peak and up to the current date, we've seen over 400 additional deaths in our communities outside of hospitals. And uh, our PMART team, those specialist officers, have attended um, the vast majority of those. And that's an unpleasant but a vital role. What, what we're looking for there is to maintain the dignity and the compassion in death, whilst obviously offering the best protection to our officers um, in the face of, of the virus. And that seems to have worked really well. Another area of good practice has been legal. That they offered a superb turnaround with the rapidly changing legislation. But really, as that's arrived overnight, that's been turned into very clear, simple officer guides so we can share the latest position right across the organisation. So that really speaks to the internal media and uh, we internal comms. How do we talk to the organisation at these difficult times? Well, we, we've created a bespoke app called Backup Buddy with a, a, a section that's really comprehensive all around COVID with daily COVID updates, all of those officer guides, and then a range of, of things in addition just to support our staff in the broadest sense around how do you keep physically active and fit during this challenge? How do you keep psychologically healthy, but also socially? How do you keep in contact both at work and outside of work. Um, and that appears to have served as well in terms of the, the abstraction rates that we've seen. Link that with the PPE, and we now have a small mountain of PPE in the ops complex up to the ceiling of the hangar. Um, at no point have we been, been at a point where we couldn't offer the full range of PPE necessary to our staff. And indeed, we provided over and above that in terms of sourcing visors, um, aprons and additional gloves. Um, over and above the recommendations. So we're in a, a pretty strong position in regards to PPE. Um, in terms of governance and, and moving forward, we continue with weekly gold meetings, still the last twice daily um, uh, meetings right across the force. We have that seven-day command and control in place. Again, another point I'd just reference is our data cell using our BCI staff, some superb analytics when Modelling nationally said it couldn't really be done. Our staff um, did their work taking the information available, and I have to say that prediction proved to be extremely accurate almost to the day around the rate of um, excess deaths, what would happen to our demand. So that's been a, a real strength and assistance, and that's flowed from four structures into the strategic coordinating group under the LRS um, of supporting that effort. So the position now really, the structures are still in place. I see July the 4th uh, that we're going to move from response into recovery. That's going to have the same focus in terms of command resources and those structures. And we'll be working with the strategic coordinating group. And as that transitions into the strategic recovery group at county level, 
we will be playing our part in terms of the safety and recovery of the county. Um, speaking to the, would you like me to go on to the demand and talk around DA for a little bit now, uh, Commissioner? Can I just pause you for one second and just to say, um, having heard what you've said and, and been observing what you've been doing, of course, over this period of time, I, I do congratulate the force very much the speed with which you realised what this pandemic meant uh, and the, the impressive way in which you, you, you've done everything since then with the Gold Group, and particularly around PPE, because I know lots of other organisations and forces have struggled over this and South Yorkshire never has. And that was really because you were on the ball right from the beginning. And I think we've now seen some impressive managing of really difficult incidents, uh, the flood uh, last year, now COVID this year, from South Yorkshire Police. And, and I would like to place on record, again, the thanks to the public for the speed with which this has been done and the impressive way that this has um, uh, been done by, by the force. Uh, and I do agree with you. I think the work of the analysts has been really good in this, uh, enabled us to understand the progress of things in, t in a timely fashion that will be prepared for it. And from my recollection of um, what I've heard coming out of Gold Groups, I think the force here realised very quickly what was happening in care homes, um, probably ahead of um, that being noted on a more national scale. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Commissioner. And I'd really extend that to the county level, really the joint approach across the local authorities and across the key partner agencies. Um, at LRF level, it has placed it in a very good um, position in that there's just been a, an interim review for lessons learned, uh, and that looked at 11 different local uh, resilience forums, and I have to say that reflected on us extremely well as a county, as our preparedness around all of those areas. So um, I, I think we're in a, a, a pretty strong place as a county. Yeah. Commissioner, would you like me to, to, to talk around uh, demand and talk around DA in terms of the impact of COVID? I will, but just to say, I think we, we saw this, this same level of professionalism at the time of the floods as well as now, so that's, that's really good. Yeah. yeah, I think we do get a fair bit of practice at this, so I'll probably stand us in good stead. What next? <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, Commissioner, in terms of, of demand, um, when we were seeing our ab abstractions as we headed towards the peak, thankfully our demand did indeed come down without nighttime economy, without retail. Um, so, so really, we were able to manage through that, that, that period without any significant challenge. As Sean alluded to in his update, demand now is very much back to normal uh, in terms of levels, but it is still changing. Of course, we haven't got retail fully back. We haven't got nighttime economy back. Um, but, but we are seeing the COVID demand where we were receiving sometimes 150 to 200 online COVID reports. They now are falling rapidly, almost by the day. But that space is being picked up by what you would perhaps call business as usual around um, theft and the crime associated with our communities beginning to get back to normal. So the, the numbers of crime um, countywide are, are now pretty much stabilising as business as usual, but we will see in the next transitions of hospitality, retail, and then the nighttime economy, we will see violence coming back, alcohol-related. Um, to speak specifically around the, 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 the challenge around DA, um, what, what we saw in the first two weeks um, of reporting, whilst the rest of the country was reporting around an 8% increase in DA, we did in, indeed experience um, some suppressed recording of domestic abuse within the county, and we could see that those numbers where we would expect to um, have around 650 uh, domestic abuse investigations per week we did see those drop by around 100 in the early stages. Now, again, we recognised that and took some prompt action because that's a falling crime figure that is a real concern because that is a suppression uh, where we would have expected to see an increase because of the circumstances of, of uh, the isolation, um, but that was a real concern. So a number of things were, were put in place at that point, which, which included really a, a really comprehensive um, communications and engagement campaign. So in terms of our external website, the, the pr priority feature there was domestic abuse. Uh, we adopted the Home Office communication of You're Not Alone and the Cut the Strings campaigns, and for a full month from early April, um, we had a campaign on the radio network um, with real extensive cover, highlighting our new online reporting for, for DA 
and highlighting that this was a priority. And that did then have the desired impact that we saw reporting increase and certainly using that online, which then leads, as I really referred to as around COVID, there's been no change in capacity or focus. So domestic abuse, whether it was online reporting or conventional reporting, has the same triage and the same response from officers. All they would have to do is make sure that they were, um, you know, COVID compliant in terms of their own well-being as part of that response. But we responded as normal. What we've seen then really is that reporting level increase, get back to what we would expect. And then in the last few weeks has actually overtaken that 650 per week. And now that we are averaging around 750 reports per week, which is a good thing. This is a rise that we would see uh, has been um, welcome because this talks around vulnerability, confidence to contact us, and then our ability to do something around it. So if you were to look at that trend line, it has gone from being below what we would expect, then around uh, the third week of April, it hit what we would expect, and since then has been reporting above it. Um, so the position now is a, is a very healthy one where we're not seeing any suppressed demand, and we are seeing healthy levels of DA reporting. Thank, thank you for that, and uh, we, we should stress, I suppose, that um, this is an increase in reporting. It may not mean that there's an increase in domestic abuse, though it may indicate that, but uh, those who are feel, as you say, have got the confidence to report in, that has now gone up um, since um, the, the COVID period. Thank you very much. Um, does anybody want to ask any questions of David or make any comments around that? So can I thank you very much indeed for that. That was item 11, the COVID update and uh, a note about domestic abuse. So we come to item 12, which is performance against the police and crime plan. And uh, the particular priority that we're looking at here is the priority of treating people fairly. The others, uh, of course, being protecting vulnerable people and tackling crime and antisocial behaviour. Uh, Mark, if, if this is you, this is pages. 35 to 42. Um, I, I won't ask you to go through the whole of the report. I, I'll just comment on one or two things, and then if uh, there are things that you want to uh, draw out that I haven't mentioned. If I take you first, first of all to page 36, uh, 3.4, um, this is around the whole business of um, the creation of the virtual courts. I, I want to say, first of all, as with other reports that we've had to commend the force for the speed with which you did things here, could you say a little bit about that, what uh, what the problems were and what you did to uh, overcome them? Yeah, well, I think, as you can imagine, Mishra, uh, a custody environment is potentially one that presents serious issues with social isolation in terms of dealing with people. Um, there were concerns about solicitors coming into custody blocks as well as, obviously, prisoners and then dealing with our staff, so it's clearly the case that we've got to continue arresting people where it's warranted. Uh, so provision has been made to ensure that people can be interviewed, uh, witnesses can be rem interviewed remotely, uh, listeners can give advice in a secure yet remote fashion uh, so that we can minimise the potential risks of people being in custody uh, and also supporting the use of online courts whereby uh, people don't necessarily have to go to a court for initial hearing. Uh, it can be dealt with in the custody blocks. So I think that, that's our attempt to support the criminal justice system because, as you've alluded to, I think we are all conscious that with the backlogs in courts no longer hearing as many cases, the very difficult restrictions on jury trials uh, for social distancing means uh, there is a, a considerable backlog building up in the system We've just been really keen to make sure that we haven't stopped business. We are still getting things up to the stage where we would hand them over to the criminal justice system as much as possible uh, so that we don't add to a further backlog pipeline, as it were. Uh, I think the IT services have been very responsive to the needs of the force. Uh, they've put in the various measures alluded to in the report in relation to that, putting the CJ custody process but then the broader range of things that are mentioned in the reports as well. Are, in terms of the virtual courts, are we just talking about Shepcott Lane, or is this wider? Uh, it would be wider, um, because obviously...
so we've kept all the custody blocks open in terms of receiving prisoners. Uh, so they've all got some of the capability to, um, to take prisoners in, to deal with them. We haven't shut any of the blocks. Um, so they've all remained functional. Okay. Thank you. I'll take you to the next paragraph, 3.5. I was intrigued by this because I'm not quite sure that I understand what this is all about. Um, could, could you explain this is a, um, a, a way of um, uh, dealing with the public or meeting with yeah. the public in, in a remote way? Could you yeah. just think about it's that? It's the opportunity. the most 
moment, and we can all understand the concerns uh, arising out of the events in America. I, I do think there is some quite casual language uh, where events over there are somehow transposed to events here, and that's not to be complacent at all. Uh, we're all cognizant of the issues that the police service here have had, although of a completely different degree, I would stress to those in America um, over, over the years. But I do think things are being conflated somewhat unfairly <clears throat> in terms of the police force in this country, which I think has recognised issues and has taken great strides to try and make sure that we are viewed fairly <clears throat> and, and in a positive light by everyone in this country. So, yes, I think that discourse uh, won't help. I think we've just got to re-emphasise the positive steps that we take uh, in this country to be policed by consent, and you don't get that legitimacy without being fair to all members of the community. And I think the work we do here locally with the independent ethics panel, the various um, independent advisory groups are all testing the commitment that we want to be a police service for all our communities and not one that's in any way exclusionary. Yeah, thank you. And as you say, I have asked the independent ethics panel to make this uh, one of the areas that they um, particularly focus on. Andrew, I wonder whether you wanted to say anything about that? Has Andrew gone? I think he may have gone. No, I'm here. Oh, you are? Okay. Sorry, I, I thought I had unmuted myself. I do beg your pardon. Right. I, um, what I was going to say, Commissioner, thank you for the opportunity to speak, was that I did report on this <clears throat> at the last PAB, and the minutes there record the two matters which were of concern, most concerned to us in relation to um, recruitment and promotion of same um, members of the force. Um, <clears throat> and those are both alluded to in the record of the Chief Constable's discussions with his advisory group. So there is a there is a unanimity of view about what the issues are. Their recruitment and there's a and secondly, um, there is the uh, gap now at sergeant level. Um, some fame sergeants having been promoted to inspector. Um, one of the questions you just asked the dep um, was one that also concerned us, which is what is there in other forces that we might be able to learn from. And, and that's not to say that the efforts made by South Yorkshire Police in this regard are unappreciated or unnoticed. Um, I, I, I suspect that it's quite a long job to uh, understand what other forces have done to lift the figures, but they do remain, and they do remain stubbornly low in, in South Yorkshire uh, and that hasn't really changed in the, uh, is it five or six years that the ethics panel has been at this at your request. I don't know whether whether it would be helpful for, for Mark to just deal with any lessons that might be learnt from other forces, not, not of course, disregarding the, pre the uh, attempts made within South Yorkshire, which have all been well-intentioned. Mark, did you want to say anything? Or, or the chief? Uh, well, we do speak to other forces, we try and incorporate those lessons, and of course we've got the College of Policing, which brigades that information, so I don't think uh, we're shy about bringing those uh, to us, as I say, review the recruitment process on a regular basis, uh, but it is it's a stubborn issue, uh, the Independent Ethics Panel have given it considerable thought, and there is no uh, simple answer to it, I think we maintain our efforts, as I say, the recognition that we are an employer of choice, as identified by the um, diversity group nationally, is a positive for us, and we've got to get that message out to reassure people that if they come and work from us, whatever the background, they'll have a great career with the force and do a great job for the public. Um, yeah. There are sadly no simple answers. No. If I could come in as well, Helen, uh, it's the Chief. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, just I mean, just echo the point that uh, Mark has made. I mean, it is absolutely the case that um, we we have, of course, um, we have had a very active positive action campaign that com that continues, and um, some of the core tenets of that positive action campaign are precisely to look at the experience of other forces, so that uh, where there are lessons. 
our hands is to make sure that there are absolutely no barriers to entry, there are no reasons why um, uh, individuals from BME uh, communities um, should not seek what is a fantastic and fulfilling career in the service. We have uh, populated throughout SYP people from different backgrounds, all of whom are willing through our staff associations and to act as personal ambassadors to speak to people about their own experiences of um, life in SYP and to do so really positively and in an engaging way. Um, I am I am not convinced that there are things that can't be done better. Of course there are. That's why we're constantly reviewing our processes. But I am similarly at this point in time absolutely not aware of any barrier whatever to people from BME uh, communities. And as a result, it is my encouragement to members of the BME communities who um, consider that a life uh, as a police officer might be for them to um, to give it a go, to apply, see where they get to. Uh, and of course, the point is well made that you know we do have gaps uh, in terms of the rank structure, but of course, the difficulty that we have in representation of the sergeant rank is only because several of those sergeants were recently successful and have been promoted to inspector. We haven't run the next sergeant's process and we hope that some constables will be successful in that process and will start to get up. So we are seeing people moving through the rank structure, being better retained uh, as well. And so I, I guess the point being, this is not in any way about being complacent, but neither is it, um, neither is it um, the case that we have um, at our disposal some sort of magic bullet that's going to make all of this go away. It, it really does depend on people of the right quality, people who really want a career in policing, who have the right motivation, the right values. Um, to encourage them to give it a go, because I think they'll find the force a very welcoming, very inclusive uh, community where we're, we're here to serve all people to the best of our ability. Thank you. And uh, But it clearly is going to be an area that, that will be under some scrutiny in the coming months and years, and one which um, I, I will ask the IEP to continue with and, and to press on with. You're right, it's a real opportunity for, because of the recruitment that's going on, it's a real opportunity for BAME um, people to join the force and make a difference from the inside. That would be really it, good. It's a fantastic opportunity, and again, if I just take the opportunity to plug the fact that we are recruiting like, frankly, we are recruiting like never before at the moment, uh, and that will continue over the coming months and years. So there are fulfilling, valuable jobs are plenty to be had in policing. And my encouragement to members of minority communities, as well as everybody else, is give it a go because it, it will be a fantastic career choice and you can do some good with your lives for the benefit of others. Thank you. Is there anything else, uh, Mark, on those pages 35 to 42 that you wanted to say anything about this? We've not yeah, just a couple. Yeah. It's, it's just highlight. Uh, it's page 36, paragraph 3.7 down, really. Um, one of the things about attracting uh, and keep a happy workforce is the degree to which we look after them. And I think just in that point there, or those series of points, it does give some detail about the uh, importance we place on the well-being of our staff, the look, how we look after them. I think there's been some quite good and innovative practice around it, certainly in terms of both COVID but the broader well-being. So I think that is just worth highlighting the lens that we do go to look after all our staff, which, of course, makes us more of an employer of choice. And then the other thing is just to note that during the um, restrictions and the pandemic, the support we've had and the special constabulary has been absolutely superb. Uh, we get great support from them at all times. But a number of them have been 
furloughed from their own jobs um, and they've taken the opportunity to actually give us even more of their time uh, and contribute to us to support the public effort. And like all officers, that does entail putting themselves at a degree of risk uh, from the greater contact during the pandemic. So I think it'd be remiss not to highlight the sterling efforts of the Special Constabulary during this, uh, this period. Well, thank you, Mark. And, and I did make a statement in support of this special, which is on our website, because they had a weekend last weekend in which they were nationally um, celebrating the, the work that they do. Um, thank you very much. Anybody else want to comment on that report? Or In that case, can we come to the Chief Executive's reporting? Uh, this is item 13, the, the post-COVID landscape. And this is a report that came separately, so it may not be headed item 13, but that's what it is. It's um, how did policing cope with COVID-19 in the lockdown phase? I'll ask Michelle, I'll ask Michelle to, to say a word. Has in, left the conference. And I think Tim Forber also wants to comment on this, but perhaps I could just say that um, I sit on um, an economic recovery group that the mayor, the elected mayor, has for the whole of the... Um, South Yorkshire and beyond region, and um, I was, we had a meeting this week in which we were looking at the, the economic impact of COVID and beyond on South Yorkshire, and um, there, there are some opportunities that are going to clearly arise, and um, we hope that, that businesses will be able to take advantage of that, but there's clearly going to be quite an impact on employment, unemployment in South Yorkshire, and especially amongst the 18 to 24 year olds. They seem to be hit most of all, of all the age groups um, in our communities. They're really going to be hit by the prospect of um, the collapse of the economy and um, the loss of jobs. And that, of course, will raise issues for the police because these will become very vulnerable people open to the blandishments and inducements of organised crime. And we really will have to our minds to that as to how we prevent these young people becoming um, drawn into criminality over the next um, uh, months and, and years. Having said that, um, Michelle, would you like to say a word about this uh, report? Right. Have we got a fault in the technology or... Is, is Tim, Tim, are you on the line?
Um, we've talked about domestic abuse and um, the efforts the force have made to encourage uh, reporting by those that may be um, in, in lockdown unable to feel that they can report as easily. Um, we've talked we've talked about those issues. Uh, we've also talked about uh, her left the conference. The general approach and uh, the way the public responded in South Yorkshire very positively um, to the force. Approach of engagement has left the conference and, and, and educate. Um, you've mentioned the economy, which was really the only thing that hasn't been touched on um, already this morning. Um, and, and Dave has talked about um, the crime volume. Um, so, in terms of policing and, and COVID generally, the, the, um, the heading policing and paragraph 3.7 onwards um, talk, talks about public confidence uh, needing to be maintained through the relaxation of lockdown and, and current issues that have been seen um, nationally as globally. Um, government funding, we are um, maximising our opportunities to obtain government funding to support the, the efforts that's been made during the COVID-19 situation um, and um, external funding opportunities for commission services for victims, witnesses, um, etc. have all been maximised um, through your office. Um, Alan, we continue to do so. Uh, we've already had discussion around op up list and recruitment in relation to that. So if I can turn to the wider criminal justice system, um, as you said at the, at the top of this report, we are um, hold, holding the criminal um, meetings. You chair joined the conference. You chair that local criminal justice board uh, now, and we've been holding meetings fortnightly to keep the momentum on. Um, activity and recovery planning. Um, there are, there's a task and finish group in relation to that that uh, is, uh, is, is contributed to by part, the partners, the CPS court service, um, the probation services and, and the police force. Um, led by your office as a business manager, we are looking at data gathering so that we understand the backlogs that have arisen um, in the criminal justice system primarily at the court door, quite literally, because of the reductions in sitting days, which is controlled by the judiciary rather than the court uh, admin. You've held ministerial calls to raise uh, your concerns about this. It's nationally driven, so locally there's only so much influence we've been able to, to, to have. But we've had some good news this week in relation to data release to allow us to see if we can do some simulation modelling so that we understand what the court needs to do to well, put on me. 15 days to be able to clear the backlogs. left to the conference. Of course, addressing those backlogs is essential for our victims, witnesses, uh, and for offenders that are at large in terms of um, semen reoffending rates, um, while those backlogs uh, are still in existence. So we're um, maintaining all of our local efforts, but we are sometimes in the hands of decisions nationally and at ministerial level, which I know, uh, Commissioner, you are plugged into. Um, and I'll give way now to ACC4 because he's been um, obviously heavily involved in in these discussions as a partnership, and uh, he may want to talk about the impact. Has joined the conference. Uh, just before Tim, we, we bring you in. Uh, just. To reiterate what Michelle was saying, yes, I do have regular, it's turned out to be weekly, uh, dial-ins with ministers to make them aware of what's happening um, on the ground. Uh, and we are particularly concerned about the backlog in or potential backlog in jury trials, because there hasn't been a jury trial held since March the 25th, I think, was the last one. And we're talking about serious crimes here, rape, murder, PSE. And if um, way for bringing these forward and clearing that backlog, then we're talking about these really, really serious crimes uh, coming to court later and later, and the attrition rate then with witnesses and victims will be considerable, uh, and the public confidence in the criminal justice system will be um, undermined if we're not careful. So it is a really serious issue that we are trying to impress upon ministers. They really do have to get to grips with it. Tim. Well, I mean, all I can do, Commissioner, is really reiterate what Michelle has said, that, um, you know, over the, um, it's not just over the COVID period, but probably for the
for the last six to eight months, we've had a real push on improving investigative outcomes and the speed at which it, we investigate crime has increased well, quite significantly. The, uh, has left the conference. The rate at which we are achieving a judicial outcome in crime has increased significantly over the last six months, and that is continuing to increase. We are uh, arresting more offenders, we are charging more offenders, we are putting more offenders into the court system. Um, and that's obviously been exacerbated over the COVID period. Um, there's definitely been an effect that dur during this period, you know, very much business as usual has carried on for us. So we've continued to process offenders, we've continued to provide an effective service to victims of crime. Um, and we're still processing every day between 65 and 80 prisoners a day through our custody suites. Um, so the issue of court backlogs has suddenly become very acute because, um, as, as you have quite rightly pointed out, um, it, it's all very well the police conducting the investigation, gathering the evidence and charging someone, um, but justice, not, justice is not achieved for a victim until that um, individual has been dealt with by the court. And as it stands at the moment, we have no idea of uh, how or when courts are going to be able to manage that backlog and, and what proposals are on the table to do that. And it's really, really important that we find that out as soon as possible. So uh, we can manage victims' expectations because it's absolutely paramount for confidence in the criminal justice system that um, victims have a clear idea right at the outset of what's involved and how long this is going to take. So, um, you know, I, I just would want to re-emphasise that point and reiterate that South Yorkshire Police um, will do everything that we can to work with our partners to, add, to, to properly quantify um, what's required so it can be delivered to make sure that we continue to, to provide that, that level of service that we aspire to. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I think we've given that a good airing. Is there anybody who wants to say anything about anything else in the report, or indeed this in the report? If not, I'm going to if not thank you very much. And um, uh, that was item 13. Shall we move quickly then to item 14? Fiona, this is uh, your report. Uh, on engagement of communication. Are you there, Fiona? Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Just to take you through that very quickly, um, we've seen, um, obviously, we've been monitoring the uh, public engagement and the public concerns during the COVID period. Fairly similar to last month, but we are seeing more of a move towards business as usual now. The concerns seem to be less around the COVID situation and more back to uh, things that we would expect, um, young people gathering, ASB, litter, um, things in communities there. So, um, as of last time, there were still some concerns around certain communities and social distancing, particularly Page Hall, Eastwood. Um, that sort of continued a little bit, but, but certainly died off in the last few weeks a little bit more. Um, increasing social media comment around young people asking parents if they know where the children are. Um, obviously, then there's the, that comes out of that is then litter in public spaces and parks where young people are meeting. Um, we've also seen an awful lot of support for the police um, around the work that they're doing um, and the making arrests and the fixed penalties that have, that have been uh, um, issued. Um, we have seen some questions being asked around officers' their powers for ensuring the two metre distance is, uh, is, is uh, respected by people, um, but we've also seen very quick responses from the force back into that to encourage members of the community to report breaches um, where necessary. Um, as I said, the, we're now moving back into more normal, what we call more normal engagement and more normal reporting of the uh, items. So ASB, litter, and other things are becoming more of a concern and less around the COVID. But other than that, the report speaks for itself. Thank you very much. And uh, we are having to think very hard now about how we engage with the public if these restrictions are to continue. Um, how we engage with the community groups, the town council, the parish council, all the rest of it. Um, if, um, if the uh, restrictions aren't uh, relaxed considerably, so we're give, giving that a little thought at the moment. Does anybody want to comment on the report or question any of it? No, thank you, Fiona. Shall we move to item 15, PCC decisions, 
deal with vulnerable people. Um, so the sponsored supplement was published on the 28th of May and it had eight stages of activities for young people in both primary and secondary schools. Um, so so we, we felt that that was useful um, to, to raise here today. And then working with the BIU and the Princess Trust, I guess the editor uh, was identified to work with the star Mike Thompson, um, a former young offender who has transformed his life and he now works with vulnerable young people. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions? No, thank you, Erica. Finally, then, the PAB work programme, Michelle, 51 to 54. Yes, Commissioner, just as normal, we provide the look ahead for future meetings for the public, panel members, members of this board, to note the reports that are going to be presented on the future occasions. Just to highlight, next meeting, 7th of July at 10 a.m., um, the, the results of the the Neighbourhood Policing Survey will be provided uh, once um, Fiona uh, has discussed those with ACC Forber through the Trust and Confidence Steering Group. Um, so uh, that, that will come forward next meeting. Good. Thank you very much. Um, anything else under any other business that uh, we need to raise, mention, which we haven't done? If not, can I thank you for your virtual attendance and uh, 